Good morning, Mr. Kinnison. I want y'all to know that when you're not watching, she doesn't address me that way. It's usually, hey! I do know. <laughs> well, welcome to the Gospel According to Kinnison, and I am your man. I am your illustrious host, Bill Kennison, and we're coming from beautiful San Antonio, Texas, down here in God's country, and it is beautiful, Sherry. It really is. Good morning, Jerry Nicholson. Good morning, Gary Witt, Derek Kustra. We've got, we have a lot of people that watch us, a lot of people, and uh, first, before we begin, I want to remember uh, uh, Reverend, or he may be Bishop, Bishop or Richard Hammonds. Remember him, Sherry? I sure do. Peoria, he, Illinois. That's right. And we opened up that church in Peoria, Illinois with yeah. four people. Do, do you remember that? Because you made me go out and preach to them. Yes. I wasn't going to preach to them. If you gonna... can't preach to four, you can't preach to 4,000. That's exactly right. What, have you been talking to my father that's moved on or what? No. He used to say that. Can't preach to five, can't preach to 5,000. And uh, But anyhow, uh, Brother Hammond uh, came to our church early on and was our associate pastor uh, until, until we left there. Mm -hmm. And uh, has a beautiful church uh, there in Peoria, Illinois. And I want to wish him a happy birthday. And I'm sure this uh, Memorial Weekend was touching for him. He loved his father. He passed away this this past year, just a few months ago. And I want to wish uh, Reverend Richard Hammond, there in Peoria, Illinois, a tremendous, tremendous birthday. I'm sure the church is going to be good to him. Also, uh, Sherry, how long has it been? 17 years. I haven't even asked you the question yet. <laughs> I know what you're going to say. I just am thankful for my tribe of Breastlink Angels, and Jill Canales runs all the Breastlink Angels because Miss Jenny moved on, and now she has passed on. And 17 years. 17 years. 17 years ago, we didn't know if he was going to make it or wasn't going to make it. I do a happy dance every day, folks. Get up That's and right. do a happy dance. And today is National Cancer Survival. Survivor Awareness Day. Day. Not one for the week or month or anything? Today. It's today. All right. Well, I want to wish all of you that have made that journey. And uh, there's people I'd get upset with and stuff, but sure, I would never wish that on anybody. Never. Even people that I don't like, I would not wish that on anyone. And I'm thankful that God brought Dr. John West, rated number one in the entire world, into our life. And Dr. Link, and they honored Dr. And Dr. Link. Dr. Link, tremendous story with Dr. Link. They I don't have time to tell night. it. But uh, tremendous story with, with Dr. Link and Dr. John West and his beautiful wife, Jan. And uh, I thank God every day, and I thank them every day for being in our lives. Yes. And uh, the main thing we found out, because the odds weren't too good for Sherry, but we found out is don't give up. Jim Valvano said that when he was dying from cancer. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. I totally agree with Jim Valvano. And uh, I think listening to this message will can spur your faith. And uh, But we're, we're, we're thankful for all of you that have uh, defeated that. And our heart goes out to those and the families that have lost loved ones to, to cancer. I just don't understand sometimes how we donate so much money and we're involved in the fundraising and raise so much money and seems like to me we get so little progress. But anyway, I want to start this out great. Yes, good morning, Chris Kyer and Mr. Cottrell, we'll see you later, and Valerie Jasso. No, 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 let's not go too fast here. Okay. That is Mr. Jeff Cottrell. Yes. He's here from California. He's either a teacher or a bishop in the Mormon church. I haven't really got that differentiated yet. But he's, I'm going to tell you something, one thing. He's a tremendous individual. I love talking to him. And a tremendous person. We'll be with him later today. 
And uh, there also are son-in-law's parents, mm -hmm. Jeff and Debbie. Love them. Love them. And Jack Friedman says, he's posted it twice now, please watch <laughs> the Gospel according to Keniston. Please watch and, and, and what like. do you call it? Like. YouTube. The Gospel of Ken, according to Keniston on YouTube. Please, because Jeff is not a nice, uh, Jared, uh, Jack is not a nice person when I don't mention it. So we want him to be happy. And I love him a lot. He does a lot for us. Thank you, Kimberly Moore. Missing well, we forgot, you. And Kimberly Moore down there in Houston. We forgot Valerie. You mentioned her, but yes. I didn't mention anybody. Misty Soper is on here. Anthony Golden. Don yeah. Morin and Cheryl Morin. Good morning. You know, I, I would like to, I'd like to, I'd like to get about a hundred million dollars and build a community with with these folks. Wouldn't that be great? It would have our own street. <laughs> That's right. What would we call it? Hallelujah Way or the Kennison Path or what? Kennison Place. The Kennison Place. But wouldn't that be great, Sherry? Wouldn't yes, that be great? It would. We'd probably need more than that, though, because we have a lot of friends. Chris Kyer says, let's build a theater. Well, we could build uh, you, a You know what? On that street, we could build a theater. Yeah, too. yeah. We're going to take that in deep consideration, Chris. We did that for 30 years. As long as you move here and take yeah, care Yeah, there of you are. There you are. That's a good deal. I'll make that deal with you. Valerie said she's in. All right. I'm not, I'm just, ha I'm not even a half kidding. I would love to do that. That would be, that'd be a desire of my heart. Anyway, last week at this time, we were in Grapevine, Texas. Yes, we were. At the Lone Star Elvis... Take the Lone Star Texas Elvis Contest. That's it. No, it wasn't Elvis Contest. I'm going to let the, the concert. Okay. Anyway, whatever. It was uh, it was fantastic. And uh, we actually did our show. You that uh, did not watch, we actually did our show in the women's dressing room. I think that's the second year in a row we've done that. Because I'm going to do my show no matter what. I, we ought to sit down sometime... And figure out all the places we've done our show from. I know we did it from the front seat of our car. A couple times. Yeah, a couple times coming from Las Vegas. Uh, we have pulled off the side of the road. Out in the wind and the cold. And did it. I mean, we're, we're, we're going to keep giving it. It's that important. And uh, God's good. I also want to remember uh, Paulette uh, in prayer uh, today. She needs prayer on her legs and, and her back. She needs a miracle, folks. We can join together. It's not a big thing to the children of God. Join together and uh, Paulette, let's yes. speak healing and a miracle over that body. She's a fantastic person. I love her so much. We were in uh, Grapevine last Sunday, and we went out to eat afterwards. Large group of us. And Sherry? Somehow, I ended up next to a Church of Christ lady, across the table from a Baptist gentleman, and next to him was a Catholic lady. And they started asking me about what we believed. Also, what, I'm trying to think, what went on that I had to use your dressing room? What was you doing out there? We had to do a noon show. and you. That's had... right, a noon show, but... Throughout the day and that evening after the last... I, how, I don't know how many people came up to me and goes, I watched you during the concert today. And they had their phones out and was watching our program, which I had no idea. And uh, we literally have thousands that, that watch us this morning, every, every Sunday morning. And uh, Sherry and I, we're still trying to get this, this uh, uh, podcast thing worked out. And, oh, Ed said she's accepting healing. All right, well, I'm, I'm giving it to her. And these folks are giving it to her. Yes, they are. We love her. We love her. And all, any of you that need a miracle today, this is your day. And she this, made such an impact. I can't even tell you how many people in Grapevine, Texas, at the concert asked me, when's Paulette coming back? You know, Sharon, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get into it. You go ahead and preach. But they did miss Paulette. She was with us last year, and they did miss her, and uh, 
and just just I, I guess I get I just get amazed with the people that I run into that I have no idea who they are that come up and goes I watch your program every Sunday or I watched your program last week. Folks, this will make you free. This will make you free. I want to I want to teach a little bit on you have to be out of your mind. Title this stuff. We did, and also uh, that made me think of a uh, very, very, very close friend up in well, she's not in uh, Buffalo. She's on a little ways out of out of Buffalo now, and. Uh, my weekly little message that I send out, or that I put on the pro on the internet every Wednesday, uh, she asked for back copies. So I it took me a while, but we got them together. I sent them to her, and then she advised me this past week. I I can print it out on my computer. So for some of you folks that want to keep those Wednesday lessons and you want to look them over again and again and again, uh, Lori has already shown me you can. Somehow you can print them out, and uh, that that's a, that's a big one. You see, there's five fallacies, and we need to kind of look at this in the world we live in today. There's five fallacies about life that creates a crisis. It creates violence, killing, and war. Those five fallacies, and I'm not going to dwell on them, but I'm going to give them to you real quickly. Human beings, and this is a fallacy now, Human beings are separate from each other. That's a fallacy. That is not true. There's not enough of what human beings need to be happy. That's a fallacy. That's a nice way of saying it's a lie. To get the stuff which there is not enough, human beings must compete with each other. That's not true. Don't believe that. Some human beings are better than other human beings. That's definitely not the truth. That is a lie. There's nobody better than somebody else. And it is appropriate for humans to resolve severe differences created by all the other fallacies by killing each other. That's a lie. That's a lie. You see, you think you're being terrorized by other people. But in truth, you're being terrorized by your beliefs. That's what's terrorizing you. I say again and again that you cannot change the conditions of anger, violence, loss, sorrow, and terror by political or economic means. You cannot do it. Just, just look at the world. Look at our country. And tell me where the political parties are making anything better. Tell me where on our economic situation here in this country that, some, that they're making it better. Listen, you can affect these conditions. That is, you can alter them somewhat for a short period of time or you can interrupt them, but you cannot eliminate them without a change in your beliefs. You've heard me say this now for the last few weeks. And every once in a while I get a hold of a, a little thing that just clicks with me. And I say, again, I'm going to say it right now. Because belief creates believers. I mean, behavior. Beliefs create behavior. The purpose of this ministry. Somebody said, why do you get up every Sunday? Why do you get on here and teach? You don't get paid anything. Why do you do that? I do it for the purpose of, of awakening people and to heal the world. That's, that's why I'm doing it. What you seek to heal are wounds of your beliefs. If your beliefs are wrong, and most of the time they are, if they're wrong, nothing good is going to happen. You see, the overriding desire of humankind is peace. That's what everyone wants. We don't like getting up in the morning and see if there's another war. We don't like to get up and see if there's a, a spy balloon crossing our country. We don't like uh, a Chinese, uh, a their ship 
Come and come close to us. We want peace. We want peace. You see, I'm showing you that your current beliefs do not render you very peaceful. Just listen to this a little bit. It'll start making sense. Peaceful is not something you do. Peaceful is something you are. One does not say, I'm going peaceful. No, one says, I am being peaceful. Beingness is an expression of the soul and the mind. Doingness is an expression of the body. I know that, I, mean, I don't know how many people there in, in uh, they're in grapevine. Said, I've never heard anyone speak on things that you speak on. But I won't get into the reason why, but very, very quickly, uh, if, they're relig if they're in a religious organization, they're not allowed to, to say these things. They'll be fired without a job, and most ministers don't have a, a retirement plan. Now listen, they're going to preach until they die. But I don't mean that out of commitment. They're committed to the paycheck. Boy, it got quiet on them, Lord. Maybe it's just me. You see, all experiences of the body arise out of the experience of the soul or the mind. You get to choose which one. If you choose your mind, as your mind feels, so the body does. That's, that's exactly how it works. If you choose your soul, as the soul feels, the body does. Are you starting to see it? The soul also feels joy because the soul is joy. That's when you all of a sudden find this joy. You didn't know where it's coming from. It's the soul. The soul also feels love because the soul is love. In order to feel this always, you have to be out of your mind. You have to get out of your head and into your heart. If you stay in your mind, you'll be affected by the constructions of the mind. Some of you may ask, well, isn't that the way the old-time religion people uh, makes people feel? Doesn't it make people feel excited, unlimited, exuberant, joyful, healed, and victorious? Well, I was raised that way, and yes. Yet it is a promise your old religions have not been able to keep for humanity as a whole. Why is that? Now listen, because organized religion, as you currently create, it is a largely exclusive experience. Hmm. You haven't found a way yet to include everyone in the same experience because you have not found a way for everyone to agree on how the experience should be experienced. Let me tell you something. So, if we believe in life, we believe in God. You cannot separate God from life. And you cannot separate life from God. You can say you believe in life, but not in God. But that is like saying you believe in the brain, but not the mind. You can see and touch the brain, so you know it's there. You cannot see and touch the mind, so you're not sure what that is or whether it is there or not. The brain is the mind physicalized. Yet, it is your mind that allows you to even contemplate your brain. Without your mind, you would not even know that the brain exists. It's exactly the same way with God and love. So we don't have to believe in God in order to change the world. Now listen, you got to really pay attention. We like to think that those people who believe in God have a head start. But not necessarily. Matter of fact, I've told you on this program, I think you're probably... Easier to accept this if you haven't been raised in church somewhere or in a temple somewhere or in a different a faith somewhere. 
I think that it would be easier for you to, to, to accept this. Sometimes a belief in God can be a disadvantage in changing the world. Everything depends not whether you believe in God, because you'll have everybody tell you, I believe in God. Well, it doesn't depend on whether you believe in God, but what you believe about God. Whew. I've already told you that you don't have to believe in God at all in order to use your beliefs to change the world. I want to explain that. All you have to do is believe in life. And you do believe in life because you're experiencing it. Yet if one of, the, one of those who does believe in God, what you believe about God can have an extraordinary impact on what you believe about life. As well as how you live your life and how you experience it. So your belief about God becomes crucial. We're going to get some good stuff here in a moment. You see, the world is in the place it finds itself in today, a place of crisis, violence, killing, and war because of what we currently believe about God. Somebody said, how does that work out? Well, I'm going to tell you. What are the beliefs that we have about God that create crisis and violence and killing and war? First, you believe that God needs something. That's what we're taught. Second, you believe that God can fail to get what he needs. That he may not be able to get it. Fourth, or third, you believe that God has separated you from him because you have not given him what he needs. Man, this is sad. This is sad even to speak it, but it's true. Fourth, you believe that God still needs what he needs so badly that God now requires you from your separated position to give it to him. And the fifth and last one, you believe God will destroy you if you do not meet his requirements. These five fallacies about God have brought more pain and destruction to your day-to-day -day existence than all of your other beliefs combined. Some of you don't see how these beliefs about God create crisis and violence and killing and war between people. You think it's appropriate to act with each other in the same way you believe God acts with us. Hmm. You also think that when you create crisis, violence, killing, and war, you are doing so in order to meet God's requirements. You think you're actually helping God meet his needs. Hmm. Many of you believe that God wants crisis, violence, killing, and war. If that is what it takes for you to fulfill your requirements. Man, where did all this come from? I can tell you where it all came from. It came from religion. From the earliest days, you have described the worst human experiences and disasters. Even man-made acts of terror as the will of God. They even have a, a clause in your insurance on what is covered in an act of God. And most of the time, it's not covered, by the way. In fact, your effort to understand the bad things that happened to you is how you came to the existence of a God in the first place and to believe in a God who does bad things. That's where it came from. In our most primitive times, you would, have, you would call the caveman Aaron before. Humans did not comprehend the simplest aspects of life around them. They just couldn't do it. All they knew was there was life around them. That is, there was something other than them. The other thing that existed demonstrated itself all around them. 
It showed up as wind and rain. It showed up as sun and moon and clouds, plants and trees, and tiny living things that you know, that we know and we call insects and large living things that we now call animals. And there are spectacular effects such as fires that started spontaneously in the forest, thunder and lightning from the sky, huge waves from the ocean, and sometimes a frightening shaking of the very ground itself. Now listen, Homo sapiens did not know what to make of all these things. I'm talking about back as the cavemen. They did not know why people died, why hurricanes or tornadoes or droughts came along and destroyed everything, and why anything happened at all. They just could not comprehend it. In order to make some sense of these things, each human, early humans concluded that there must be some power greater than theirs that made these things occur. Now we're starting to find out how we looked at God. They imagined that spirits that cause good and evil to manifest themselves in their lives in many ways. As they watched day turn into night, night into day, grass grow and flowers bloom and trees lose their leaves and get them back again, they began to deify nature. They imagined, now listen, this is what, what our forefathers were doing. They imagined rain gods. They imagined the sun god and many other gods that did things according to mood and whim. What had to be done, they reasoned, was to somehow affect the mood and to please the gods. You don't want to upset the gods. And then the gods would do as they ask. Oh, Sharon, you know, last week, yeah. you was out there singing, and I took it on myself to go an extra 15 minutes. Okay, you just go as long as you well, want. Well, I don't know if I'm going to do that today. Okay. You just but I just wanted to let you know I did it last week. You see, all manners of, right, of titles and rites and rituals were created to call forth the spirit of whatever gods. That's where these gods started coming from. There were rites of, of fertility and and. There was rites of passage and rituals of every kind and intention. They, de they developed through the centuries into what became what some of you know as our pagan customs. How many has ever heard that when it come up Christian time? Christmas time. You got Christians or you got people that are in organized religion that have decided that Santa Claus was a pagan god. The Easter Bunny was a pagan god. And all that kind of stuff. So, these myths turned into beliefs. That is, they became true to the people. When myth turns into truth, listen, when myth turns into truth, it becomes organized religion. Man, I want to repeat that. That may be the best thing I've said today. When myth turns into truth in our minds. It becomes organized religion. From so-called pagan religions to be the mainstream religions of our time was not a very big leap. I've got to be honest. Most people today continue to believe in a greater power than themselves, and most people continue to believe that there is something they must do to placate the source of that power. Why, I want to ask you a question. Why is teaching our children the truth a problem? Because what we're teaching them is not the truth. I look at, I look at my life. And I really believe God was in control from the time I was born. I really do. I told these people that were having lunch with us, was asking me these questions. And I told them, I said, you know, when I was growing up, I hated church, and I think I disliked God more than I disliked church. And I remember the one lady, the Church of Christ lady, 
started scooting a little farther away from me, and I go, what are you doing? She said, I'm, I'm afraid God's going to strike you or dead or something, saying that kind of stuff. And I go, no, no. God wants us to ask questions, and he'll give us the answers. The more I look back at my life, the more I see that God was in control, even to the point. In October of 1969, I came across a girl, and I fell in love. And we end up getting married. We've been married over 50 years. It'll be 51 years in August. Sure, I believe that was God putting us together. Now, for most people, I don't think it's true for us. It was that not what man is, or what God has put together, don't let man put asunder. I think that was us. In that period of time sharing, we can't even list the miracles that we've seen people have. Instant miracles. We've seen blind eyes open. We've seen them that were, were stuck in a wheelchair, get up and walk. We've seen every man or I have a brother had the greatest miracle I've ever seen. You can have the same thing. The power is within you. You don't have to look for another preacher to try to get lucky and, and, and pray for you and get lucky and you get healed or you get blessed. You can do it yourself. You have the power. And God has led you on this journey. He allowed you to pick it and he has led you on this journey. It's a journey that's supposed to be full of love, blessing, success, health, joy, peace. That is yours automatically. All you have to do is declare it and believe it. Declare it and believe it. It's worked too many times in Sheridan's lives to not know that it's true. Get rid of some of those things those thoughts that religion has put in your head. Some, some, you know, somebody said, well, when you're talking there, hear about Jesus and, and, uh, and, and about how that God did things. God does whatever you allow him to do. Let him be your healer today. Let him be your blesser today. Let him be that miracle worker for you today. That is his desire that you enjoy those things. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time you give us this morning. Seems like it goes by so fast. But I ask that it finds a, a way in the heart of those that listen to us. And I'll give you all the praise. Amen. 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 Jeff McLaughlin, good morning. He, he makes so many posts I can't keep up with him. But he don't mess around. If he posts something, he posts like 20 of them. And some of them, I, I, I can't read them out loud. Steve Kaufman says amen, and he loves that tie. It's not. I know. Oh, Lord. Okay. It's their whole family. It's yes, it is. Yes. yes, it is. And I love that family. Misty Soper said she loves this. Well, I love Misty Soper. Amen. Amen. All right. Happy. God loves you. I love you. Sherry loves you. Have a great week, everyone. God bless America.